Good morning, friends. Good morning. I want to share with you an, an amazing idea which I just heard from one of my very, very uh, dear friends and colleagues in a weekly show, and I want to expand on the idea and double-click on it a little bit. So we know the very famous opening line from the parsha, Vayikach Korach. Korach took. And quite incredibly, it doesn't seem to tell us what he took. We know it's Korach, and we know there's a taking. We just don't know what's taken. This is a mystery, and the Marfarashim jump on this. Rashi comes and gives his explanation, we mentioned already, and Unklus gives his explanation, and they seem to agree that he took himself. He took himself, and he separated himself. And actually, Unklus, that is the Aramaic translation of the Torah, translates the word of Yikach, to take. I mean, I'm sure there's Aramaic words for taking, Kicha, but he says, Ve'itpaleg, he separated him. There was a plukta, there was a, a separation, a division. A division that happened because of his actions. Things were together, and then things were separated. Things were unified, and then things split apart. What number, what number represents the idea of things splitting apart? Well, where do we see the first ever division in the world in creation on the second day of creation, right? On the second day of creation. That's Monday. Interestingly, the Shir Shel Yom, the Shir Shel Yom, the song of the day that we say every single day, there's a different song we sing, the Levim used to sing in the Dukhan. On a Monday, if I remember correctly, is Mizmor Shir Libne Korach, the children of Korach. So Korach's children, somehow his sons, survived this entire ordeal. They survived it. And because of that, there was a, from, their, from his descendants, there was a shear that was sung. Why exactly was it sung on a Monday? Well, we said Monday is the second day of creation. And on the second day of creation, we know that there was a division between Shemayim, Varetz, first day it was unified, day two was separate. So two is actually not a great number. Two represents a splitting up, a taking of that which is one, which is echad, which is unified, which is shalem, and it splits it up. And that's why many people refrain from certain uh, activities they used to, not anymore, which involve the number two, things that split. We don't like splitting. And come along the descendants of Korach, and they say, oh, we're going to come, we're going to sing a song of thanks to Hashem in order to somehow fix up, mitaken, complete the um, division that our father, Korach, did by bringing division to the Jewish people when he, Paleg, wanted to go against and split the Jewish people. Okay? So that's why we sing a song from the children of Korach on Monday, as we did this morning. Okay, there is a very interesting Rashi that describes an event that happened during this entire Korach episode. And it's a very weird episode, actually. If you, if you look at it uh, as an outsider, which we are at this point, it talks about clothing that they wore. They wore certain clothing, these, this revolt against Moshe Rabbeinu, against Aharon, when they came along and said, it's not fair, how come you, Moshe, the leader, and I am from Kahat, I should get the job, it should be given to Elit Safan, it should be given to me, it shouldn't be given to Aaron Cohen. I should be the Kohen Gadol, what makes them so special? This is the uh, claim of Korach, and like any populist movement, all populists need to have people following them. It's not enough just to stand there on your soapbox shouting, screaming, it's not fair, it's not fair. Movements in world history are never successful if it's one person, no matter how amazing, how brilliant they are, just to stand by themselves on their soapbox screaming, shouting, what about me, 
I want to be left out. What do they always do? They attract. They attract people who they use as a way to um, foment and to popularize their position. It could be, as in this case, that those people don't have the same motivations and don't have the same desires and even the same end goals as you, but they will join in. We see these protests happening now against uh, the Jewish people, against Israel, because they're synonymous. And you look at them all, and you look at these people, and they're like, what is this crazy mixture of complete mishugaim, right? Some of them wearing kafirs. Some of them dressed up like they're, you know, like it's Purim. Some of them advocate, advocating causes that have absolutely no connection whatsoever to the other people who are also protesting. They find some kind of intersectionality. They find overlap. And they're like, oh, we're together in this. Are you crazy? If you lived in Gaza right now, they would kill you in a minute. And yet you're willing to... What this shows is, is that it's a populist movement. Really, they don't know what's going on at all. They're completely ignorant. These particular people will leave that aside of anything. They wouldn't even know, identify... Israel on a map, let alone Gaza, but we'll leave that aside. That's not the point. The point is they just joined a movement because they want their own agenda, their own motivations to win over. And so that's what they do. They go and they join this populist movement, and that's precisely what Korach is hoping for and happens. And there are three groups in this particular movement that come together, Neged Moshe against Moshe and Aaron. And who are they? Well, first of all, you have Korach himself, but that's not enough. Then you have Datan Vaviram. You have them too, Bnei Eliav. And then you have an On Ben Pelet, but he's going to leave the scene very soon. His wife saves him from calamity. And finally, we have 250 incredible people. Hamishim time Nisi Eida. These are very high-level individuals among the Jewish people. I mean, these aren't just like, you know, some crazy people of the streets. These are people who were judges and had tremendous credence. So each one of these groups, really, at this point, we're going to see come together, but actually they come for different motives and different, and actually the way that Moshe and Aaron relate to them, all these three groups, if Korach, I guess his family are part of that as well. We have Datan and Viram, who have been a thorn in the side of Moshe and Aaron since the early days back to Mitzrayim. And finally, we have the final 250 people that go with them all. So Korach does the following. He dresses them up. It's not Purim, he dresses them up in a very particular material. And it says, Vehil Bishan, says Rashi. He dressed them up, Talitot. In talitot, in cloaks, in garments, shekulan techelet. They were totally made of techelet. What's techelet? Techelet is an incredibly uh, beautiful royal blue, a very deep blue that was extracted from an, a certain aquatic creature that we pretty much know what it is today, called the chilazon. It only exists in Eritrea. Do I do have a friend who managed somehow, somehow to import a chilazon dry and then re-wet it and a whole bunch of them and ended up... So there is a couple here in North America, but they're not found naturally in North America. They're found primarily in Eritrea and I believe Greece. And they extract the blood and they put it through a certain um, cooking process and it turns this beautiful royal blue. There is a mitzvah to make a strand of the tzitzit, this blue. And this blue reminds us, say Chazal, the rabbis, of the oceans, the seas, which reflects and reminds us of the Shemaim, the Rekia, the blue of the heavens, which reminds us of God's Kisei Kavod, his great royal blue royal throne. It's a royal blue for a reason, and that reminds us of Hashem. So we have this, constant, this color gives us a constant reminder of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Actually, the word Techelet comes to the word Tachlit. 
I believe it's the same spelling. Tachelet is tachlit. It gives us our purpose in life. Although for a long time this color was missing, not anymore, was missing from Amun Kal Israel, a tzitzit is still. So what he did was is still kasher um, even without it. Um, what we do is we put, um, or they have, they put those black lines or blue lines on a talit, should really be blue, on the talit, on the garment itself, and that comes to represent it. But the, the strand is the better way to do it, of course. That's the real mitzvah, dot right da, of the talit. So we actually created cloaks that were fully made of tchelet. Why would he do that? No one says you should do such a thing. What was his point? And he brought them and stood them in front of Moshe. Amr he had a conversation with Moshe Rabbeinu. And he said, Efshar talichel min acher. You're telling me that if I have a talit that is fully shel techelet, chayev besishet or petura. Is it obligated in a one strand or not? If I have a garment that is fully made and colored in techelet, am I obligated to still color one string in techelet? And Moshe Rabbeinu answered this question and said, Chayevet, you do. If you were to have a garment that is made fully of techelet, this blue color, and you have strings attached, you would still need to make one string of techelet. And they started to make fun of Moshe Rabbeinu. Not a good idea, by the way. And they said, Efshar, is it possible? This is a rhetorical question. Efshar talit shel menacher. You're telling me that if I have a talit of a regular garment, a regular garment, not the chelet, and one string is enough to make it a techelet garment, zu, these garments that all these people are wearing, shekula techelet, that is fully tachel, it's fully blue, lot if dirt, atzma. Shouldn't that be sufficient? Why would I need one little string to come from it? So he started to make fun of Moshe Rabbeinu, saying, this makes no sense. You, make no, your Torah makes sense. So they started to rebel against Moshe Rabbeinu, and then they started to make and rebel against all of the Torah and Hashem himself. That's a whole new territory. What were they saying with this particular example? They're saying, you think you're so special, Moshe Rabbeinu. You're like one little strand, which we know is enough to make it all kasher. But aren't we all garments? Aren't we all techelet? And if that's so, we don't need you as our leader. This is a very clever ploy. Actually, it wasn't so clever because it bounced back on him. A very clever ploy to say that we are all techelet. Aren't we all great? Aren't we all royalty? Weren't we all at Harasinai? And there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that. But Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, even so, even, even after I've gone, if you have a garment that is fully techelet, although the Jewish people are all royalty, they're all blue, you still need a leader. And Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't saying it for himself. He was saying it for the generations afterwards. You're still going to have a leader like Yoshua is going to want for me, and other great kings, and David and Melech, Shlomo Melech, other great leaders are going to have to come along afterwards. Even though the Jewish people are all great, they're all techelet, you still need that one strand that stands out in order to give value to the entire collective. Populist movements are all well and good. However, a great leader is still necessary. And of course, the ultimate leader we're going to see, God willing, is going to be Mashiach. Although we're going to see a big backlash against him. Right? They're going to come forward when he comes. Now, Tehelet represents something. It represents a very high level of devotion to Hashem. That's what it represents. That's the color itself. What's the alternative to that? White. White is a very neutral color. Okay? Actually, when you put all the colors through the prism, they all come out white. So white is still great. It represents purity. But Tehelet is a higher level. It's a higher, greater form of devotion to Hashem. These people who came forward, these 250, when they came forward, they weren't just like rebelling, let's go. They were saying, we are great. We want to be techelet. We want to represent. That was good. Their desire was good. Once Moshe Rabbeinu said, I hear you, but this is the story. 
I understand what you're saying, but there still needs to be a leader, and God chooses who those leaders are and will be. They should have stopped, but they didn't. They just kept going, and they kept going, and that led to their downfall. Korach is the same. He wasn't just trying to, he wanted to bring greatness. He really wanted to serve a Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? He just had tremendous power problems and kavod problems and his money that he had, he had a vast amount of money, swayed him the wrong way. And he also went off the derech as well. Interestingly, later on they're going to do a test with Ketoret and these certain machtot, these certain pans, and Korach's going to be involved in it. And the 250 Nisiyah Eidah are going to involved, these 250 men are going to be involved in it, but not Tatan and Viram. Their challenge was nothing to do with being techelet. They just wanted to cause trouble and to bring the downfall. There was no great ulterior motive that came with Datan and Aviram. They just wanted to destroy. We're not happy the way it is, and they wanted to break down the whole system. They are the, um, the anarchists. That's what they are. Datan, Aviram are the ultimate anarchists. So some of you will see these moves, people walking, protesting, and many of them have a good cause that they protest for. It's understandable. They're wrong in many cases, but they're still entitled to protest. And then sometimes you'll see creeping among them are these other populists who kind of like jump on the bandwagon, although it makes no sense whatsoever. And then you'll have this small group, the anarchists. They have no right whatsoever. They, get, they don't get a platform. They are in it to destroy and the Torah, in this case, we push them aside. They're not even going to be part of the ultimate answer and solution uh, and uh, kapara, atonement, that's going to come to these people later on. Not all protests are the same. And not everyone is of the caliber of techelet. Most people, and that's okay. The garment is fully white. Most of the tzitzit are white. And without the remainder of the tzitzit, you don't have a kosher talit, even if one entire strand is missing. Even a white strand from a tzitzit or from the talit, it's not kosher. But not everyone can be techelet. Techelet is left for a very select few. And it comes with tremendous responsibility. Not everyone is the level of techelet, and that's okay. So when people say to me, oh, why can't I be Mashiach? Why can't they be Mashiach? I'm like, you don't want to be Mashiach. If you knew what a king has to go through, you'd run the other way. Right? What Moshe Rabbeinu had to go through, what David and Melech had to go through. Some of our greatest heroes and heroines had to go through tremendous challenges that most people cannot handle, and that's meant to be that way, because most people are not meant to handle it. It's left for a select techelet few. Here, the people over stood and overtook their natural boundaries and said, we're all to chelet. The desire was good. The formulation of it, however, was terrible. And that was the downfall of Korach and these 250 Korea Eda, and eventually even Datan and, and Aviram. Have a great day.